All right, everybody, welcome back to the weekly roundup edition of On the Margin. I'm your co-host, Mike Ippolito. I am joined by my loquacious co-host, Mr. Tyler Neville. What's going on, Tyler? Hey, Mike. How's it going? You look very futuristic. I'm just waiting for your joke. I'm waiting for your joke. So shut the fuck up. Boom. How do you like that? How do you like that, Tyler? How do you like it, buddy? Coal in your stocking, my friend. Coal in your stocking. You've become predictable, and I am predictable. All right. All right. No preamble this week. Let's just get right into it. Big, big stories coming up. All right, so let's just do like a, a review of like what the big stories are. There's obviously we got to talk about um, the big drop in in crypto markets. Uh, there's a dip of over 51 percent, sixth largest correction ever. A uh, bunch of macro updates. So the Fed mentioned tapering. Uh, you pointed out something very interesting between a correlation between S and P and Treasury futures, uh, as well as the imploding dollar and a rise in the VIX. Uh, and China has banned Bitcoin again. Uh, again, the reason I'm saying again with that sort of emphasis is because we've seen this before, <laughs> before, and uh, yeah, I mean, whatever, we'll get into it. You know what? There's another story that we should be talking about here, which is actually the biggest story of the week slash the year slash potentially all of human existence. Have you been following this stuff about UFOs? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how is this not everywhere? Why are more people not talking about this? I am genuinely blown away that this has not gotten more traction i don't understand Same. it's crazy to me and it's like it's wild. it's very open now that ufos are just existing all the time and existing Con- confirmed by the pentagon <laughs> and like you've got you know super high-ranking navy officers department of defense people going on to cnn and saying yeah actually there have been reports for a long period of time we've observed these things we have no idea there's this hilarious segment with Chris Cuomo and this Navy officer is like, yeah, you know, he's, he's this very serious looking guy. He's got a big beard. He's like, yeah, this, uh, this exceeds our arsenal's technology by a uh, hundred to a thousand years. <laughs> so it's like, what? Reassuring. Dude, we're living in, what? you know, the, you know, what we're really just, it's, it's a matter of fact, we're living in a simulation. This is SimCity and someone got bored up there, you know, clicking the buttons and now they're like, oh, let's throw some aliens in there. Let's just throw them in, start some disaster, some chaos. It's getting boring, this this life thing. Building buildings, who cares? <sighs> UFOs. Yeah, well, the the simulation certainly got broken in crypto uh, this past week, and that is my that is my sequitur into uh, this first story here. Yeah. So uh, market route in crypto, let's just, here is like an overview of the basics. Uh, I saw Bitcoin fall to just under $30,000 which was a decline of over 20% in just 24 hours. Uh, from its peak in April at 64,000, that re- represents a 51% dip, or, or the sixth largest in Bitcoin's history. And that includes like the dip from the peak of the 2017 bear market all the way down to 2019. So this is a really, really significant dip. Um, you know, Since that peak in April, the entire crypto market cap has shed almost 1 trillion uh, in value, uh, quote unquote. Uh, and I guess just, you know, to, to cap it all off, you know, what, what started this whole thing was Elon's tweet uh, that Tesla would no longer be accepting uh, Bitcoin as a form of payment, uh, citing concerns about the environment. And then, of course, you know, the Twitter infighting that followed. Um, I don't know. What's your take here, Tyler? Obviously, we were a little bit frothy. I had, yeah. you know, the mother-in-law indicator popped up. People came out of the blue asking me, should I buy this stuff? And I'm like, "Uh uh-oh, you know, this is getting short-term frothy. There's lots of bullish stuff. And like, I still think this is a generational wealth transfer that's going to happen. But, you know, a market with 100 implied volatility has some pretty serious uh, pullbacks. And a lot of the the weak hands got, got shaken out for sure. And I think that's the problem that happens when you have it's the middle class asset is when you have people who have lots of other expenses, maybe a mortgage, their pain threshold is a lot lower than Alan Howard, who's a billionaire or, you know, name, name several other billionaires that came out. They can hold through lots of volatility in a new asset or a private company, right? Your, your everyday person who's trying to, to compensate from the lack of yield in their checking account doesn't have that, you know, luxury. So I think they're they're the ones, especially the ones that got levered, 
with weird, you know, financial futures and options, those are the people that got taken taken out. And it's unfortunate, but you know, it ha- it happens. Yeah. I saw this thing on Twitter that there were across the major exchanges there were 775,000 accounts that had their balances completely wiped, like 100% margin called. Um, it's probably a good reminder that if you're not a professional and honestly, even if you are, why are you trading? Why are you using leverage to trade in this environment? Yeah. It just does. If you have an asset that can drop, you know, 50% in the course of a week, it just doesn't make any sense. You just shouldn't be using it. Um, yeah. I, I think it's, it's one of the things to take away, but I, I think in terms of, you know, what made this sell off particularly notable is not just, you know, the, the peak to trough level, right? 51%. That's quite a bit. But I think this was the first like kind of legitimate sell off that wasn't just a blow off top and, and clearing leverage out of the system, right? You had coins actually finding their way back onto exchanges. There was real selling on kind of the spot level uh, and then a, a much, much weaker bid. Uh, and, and I think the concern here is that, you know, the ESG narr- ESG is a super, super powerful mega trend right now. And you're starting to see, you know, I think we talked about this on the show last week, you're, you're starting to see uh, big institutional buyers, they have these ESG mandates. And there's a worry that if Bitcoin is labeled as this non-environmentally friendly asset, you know, that that demand that we always talk about unlocking uh, could go away. So I don't think that is necessarily going to happen. But I think this was the first sell off where people kind of were like, whoa, um, yeah, this is real. Yeah the, yeah. the next big thing is what happens to those institutions that, you know, said they were entering at 60K. They're, right. That's what I'm waiting for to get clarity there because there's lots of conflicting environmental stuff that says, you know, the opposite, that it's probably better for our environment. And, you know, it, all the wasted energy goes into, you know, the Bitcoin network and gives an economical value for, you know, the excess energy that gets produced. And I I think that's super valid. We'll see what happens. But I can't imagine the due diligence and the preparation that happens at the big institutional brokerage level for people like Goldman or you know City or Morgan to just say no, we're gonna we're gonna moonwalk out of here and pretend that never happened. And, and all that does is just put another you know nail in the coffin to those companies because they weren't they were late to the game on this and then they top ticked it. If that's really you know it, it, they got in after retail jacked all the prices up and. So I, I think it's more of a, if they don't keep it going to fruition, it's a it's a stain on their ego, which is really bad. Yeah, it's tough. And you know, I, I will say as well, historically, if you look at previous bull runs, you know, nothing goes, even in, even crypto, it doesn't go all up and to the right, right? If you look at the 2013 bull run, which I think from, uh, you know, bottom to top is actually the most intense you know, relative run uh, in crypto, even in crypto's history, there was a long period of stagnation, sideways trading, uh, especially for Bitcoin. Um, so, you know, a lot of folks have pointed out this is not actually unprecedented, um, you know, within the greater history of crypto bull runs. Mm-hmm. So I don't think it's necessarily anything to be worried about. I agree. I think that the big question is how are institutions going to um, going to react to this? Because so far for the last nine months, there hasn't really been anything that would really shake change their mind it's been a really easy trade for them right suddenly it's politically viable you know it's shifted from hey uh, why would you do this to why aren't we doing this bitcoin is doing nothing but going up all this narrative about central bank money printing and inflation hedge and yada yada and no one's had any real cause to question it this will cause institutions to ask questions this will raise some heckles and you know people will start trotting out those old arguments of how could something that's so solid dip 50%. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess I think you're totally right. Like we'll see who stays in the game. And I think that they'll, they'll ultimately, those are ultimately the institutions that are going to make it. Um, you know what's interesting though is the derivatives market has gotten way more mature since the last cycles, right? So mm-hmm. I even noticed that the at the money term structure for, for Bitcoin was inverted. So like that basically means the price of implied volatility at the front end, meaning like today is way higher than if you go out in the future. So it it basically means things are implied vol is cheaper the further out you go in duration. And that is 
a very interesting thing, and a lot of institutions can take advantage of this type of stuff. Higher vol is actually better if you're an institutional trading desk. You know, you're making markets and high vol stuff. You get paid a lot better. And yeah. so, so the the risk reward there still stands. It's just like, yeah, if a trillion dollars came off the the market cap, it, things just became a lot less liquid. So that's the other side of the story. So, um, but yeah, I, I think they'll stay in. It's just hard. How do you tell your clients like, oh, look, things just fell fifty percent, and yeah, you should still get access to this yeah. asset class. <laughs> Yeah, I think you're totally right to bring up market structure, actually. And it was, I guess, one of the bits of silver lining uh, or something that's really interesting to watch um, was how you saw market structure perform under extreme stress. And I think there are two different angles to this. So one, yes. you know, the centralized exchanges predictably went down, right? So that actually was, that ended up being a huge tax on retail because, you know, retail being me, including me, you know, who's signing on trying to actually buy this dip, and I'm locked out of my Coinbase. Mm -hmm. Can't buy it. It's like, dude, come on. Uh, and I get it. It's a really challenging. It's really challenging for them. But one of the most actually bullish silver linings that came out of this entire tip was that DeFi, those uh, decentralized exchanges, they did not break. Mm -hmm. And the amount of fees that got printed from Uniswap and SushiSwap in one day, oh my god. Yeah. And it was this kind of. It was. It was really. It was a, a blue check mark, in my opinion, to the functioning of, of these markets that nothing broke. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you actually look at what's happening here, you're building a market structure, you're battle testing it to a point where it can withstand 50% drawdowns. In some cases, you're actually looking at the decentralized alternatives performing better than their centralized uh, predecessors, mm -hmm. essentially. And, and, I will, and I will ask you this, what do you think would happen if you saw a commensurate drawdown, a 51% drawdown in S&P 500? the whole system would snap yeah. and fall apart. You couldn't survive that. And here you have an ecosystem that is surviving these massive volatility, huge dips, and there's no Fed, there's no lender of last resort. You're just building a decentralized market structure that can actually cope with huge volatility. Yeah. It's kind of inspiring, actually. It's super free market, right? Like, you gotta love it. This is yeah. sort of what happened when, what was that book? Uh, the Great Crash by John G Kenneth Galbraith. Like there was massive volatility in the stock market way back when. You didn't have in, in the New York Stock Exchange in, in that market way you know in nineteen twenties, and it's sort of similar in a way because you didn't have all the the guardrails and everything, and so free markets that that kind of happens. And you know they 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 probably you can't really have a circuit breaker like you do on NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange. The market structure just can't trade 24 seven. It's geographically agnostic. It's just impossible to do. So for from that sense, I think it performed incredibly well, uh, you know, in being just a fully free market, like it found it had price discovery eventually. And, and now we're, we're kind of like pinned to, to 40,000 on Bitcoin. So yeah. I think, it, I think it performed quite well given you know the volatility yeah exactly. I, I completely agree with you and you know who knows where we're going to go from here like you mentioned we're recording this on uh thursday the 20th um again one day early uh because i just got my second vaccine and i'm anticipating being completely on my back oh tomorrow. yeah uh, Get ready. but uh yeah so but you know it's hovering around forty thousand, mm -hmm. and it looks like things have stabilized right now i think there still are some jitters um you know, if there was that announcement from the IRS that payments of over ten thousand dollars are going to have to be reported, and the market like sold off ten percent on that news, which to me is like, dude, what are you saying? Basically, that was just a reminder of saying, hey, by the way, if you live in the U.S., you have to pay taxes. Mm -hmm. And by the way, they're saying in two to three years we're going to formalize. That's when we want to roll this out. So it's actually kind of bullish news. They're saying, hey, this is going to be around in two to three years, and. We view this as a, a, a real new financial tool that's going to be enduring. And just like anything else, you're going to have to pay your taxes yeah. on it. Um, and, <laughs> it's just, and so I think it's still a little weak right now um, is my is my gut intuition. But it looks stable yeah. for the time being. I, I, I'm really curious to see what happens tomorrow on Friday because you know the, the equity market bounced. And there's been a hell of a correlation between Tesla and... Ark Invest and a lot of these like non profitable tech companies and Bitcoin lately. 
And one of the things I've been talking about is, you know, is Bitcoin an inflationary asset or is it just a high growth tech stock in disguise? And we saw it decouple from that for like three months from like January to basically April. And then the end of April and May, it just basically created, went right back down to a non-profitable tech stock. And just like those, those same proxies. And what I think we, we, we need to watch that really closely to see if it diverges again. Um, but I'm, I'm afraid that like, you know, Kathy Wood owns 7 million shares of GBTC. If she gets outflows from passive, if passive in general gets outflows, that takes Tesla down, that takes Kathy Wood down, that takes GBTC down, which all, every hedge fund owns GBTC as a proxy because they never bought the spot. And so like, you're gonna see this like weird knock on effect if, if that money keeps coming out and the inflation narrative doesn't like ramp up again. Does that make sense? It's a market structure thing sense. rather than the underlying asset thing. Yeah. I, yeah, I agree. You know, it's funny. I, I completely see your point of view on this and I, I like really respect your macro opinion on a lot of stuff. I will say, I just had this experience with Kathy Wood. Uh, first time I met her in person, she was recording an episode with Pomp like three years ago. And I'm sitting in this room at that point, we're still like running the episodes for him. And she's talking about Tesla. And Tesla at this time, this was before the stock split, Tesla's trading at like 150. Mm -hmm. And every, remember every hedge fund on earth was saying, overvalued, bubble, 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 sell this thing. Yeah. And she goes, our bear case is $700, our bull case is 4,000. And I was like, I literally texted my buddy. I was like, you're never gonna believe what this woman just yeah. said, like on a podcast. And then, you know, Tesla did what it did. And I just, I, yeah, I, I just can't help but have a ton of respect for her. I just have a ton of respect for what she's done. Um, I get that right now, it's almost like, you kind of don't want Ark to own your thing right now because she, there's some questions about it, but yeah. I um, I can't help but just have a ton of respect for her. Honestly. See, I, I, have, I think the jury's still out. I think, you any any of these like bull markets, you get the geniuses that have this narrative and you know, congratulations, you nailed the past like ten years, Kathy, like hundred percent. Not not gonna lie. I think the winds of inflation are picking up. You know, I've said this ad nauseum, but like fiscal is going to go directly in people's pockets. It's not gonna bail out the capital class anymore. And that really kills pretty much any kind of company that she invests in, which is like, you know, unlimited capital for non-profitable, crazy ideas that like just, you know, is 10 years out in the future. And that works when monetary policy is, you know, going gangbusters and you're giving money to, to rich people. But like when the unemployment rate's high, you're getting paid more on, on unemployment than you are to actually work. And the cost of capital, the cost of labor all goes up in that cycle. And I don't, I don't think it's transitory. I think that's here to stay. And the one thing that math people always screw up is politics. Like, and there's no question the political like, spectrum is changing. We have a majority in, uh, in the Democrats. They want a fiscal super cycle. And that's going to just spew inflation left and right. And I just don't see these things that are like going to Mars, it's always great. It's great to say, but like, you're going to have major commodity inflation here. And that's, you can't tell a 10 year story and have someone give you capital. If interest rates are rising, the debt bubble burst. I, I agree with you, yeah. but I will also say this, like I will kind of go, I will, I'm not going to die on this hill, but I'll make this argument yeah. again. Kathy, what is the best macro hedge fund manager of the past 10 years? And the reason why she is, no one calls her yeah. that, but the reason why she is, is because what is your proficiency supposed to be if you're a macro hedge fund? You're supposed to look at these big trends, you're supposed to look at interest rates, you're supposed to make these big directional bets, and you've gotta be directionally right. Yeah. And guess what, for the last like 10 years, all these macro fund managers have been like, inflation, 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 is gonna drive inflation, the money, and they could not have been more wrong. And what was the right thing to do? You were supposed to lever up and go long tech. Yeah. And that's exactly what Kathy did, dude. That was the, I agree. That was the only thing you needed to know. Yeah. Only thing you needed to get right. But you and know what? I'll go back to this. 
It's fishy. She she got seated by Bill Huang. Come on, tell me. Come on, you can't tell me. They met at church. <laughs> There's something there. I gotta say. I don't know, I don't bro. Know. I don't yeah. know. I don't know. I I can't speculate. But in terms of performance, can't knock it. Congratulations. Can't knock it. Yeah. Congratulations. You nailed it. She's done great. Yeah. All right. Speaking of macro, let's move into some of these more mm-hmm. macro stories. Um, let's talk about the tapering. Mm-hmm. So, you know, basic outline of the story here. Some Federal Reserve officials were open to debate at upcoming meetings on scaling back their massive bond purchases, uh, which that's according to a record of the late April gathering, um, potentially putting taper talk on the table as early as next month. If you flash back to previous meetings, there's some Jerome quote uh, or Powell quote saying, we're not even going to think about thinking about tapering. This is a pretty stark reversal uh, of that earlier policy. Uh, various participants noted that it would be likely um, that it would likely be some time until the economy had made substantial further progress towards the committee's maximum employment and price stability goals. Um, U.S. Treasuries declined uh, on heavy futures volumes after the minutes were published, as investors digested the news that there was a group of officials open to talking about tapering bond buying. U.S. stocks also declined. Uh, what's your take on all this? I think it's a pipe dream to really taper. And if they do, liquidity is going to get sucked out really quick. Who is going to take up the incremental supply of buying those treasuries when you have a massive deficit is all I will say. I, I'm i very curious. I think it's a great jawboning technique. But like the market – here's what's funny about the market reaction to that. Stocks fell – Bonds also fell. Normally, bonds rally when you have a tightening or deflationary impulse. And the U.S. dollar fell, which basically tells me money is coming out of the U.S. You have money mm. fleeing the U.S. now because huge deficit. Uh, dollar is going to be perennially weak. And if the cost of capital rises, then the money will just – go out of the, the, the bond market. So I think you've repriced the equity too. And I think money is going to probably, you were seeing it flow into Europe. And, and it's this is the irony, is that Euro, the euro is strong, yet the ECB is printing more than anybody in the world. Think about that. So like, what's the point of, if you're tapering and the dollar is falling, you want the dollar to be strong. If you and if you're tapering and the dollar falls, that's like the worst combination. This is like the what you don't want. Why is that? What? Why is that happening? How? How is the 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 euro doing that then? If the ECB is really printing that much, why is it strong? I think my my suspicion is like Asian money is leaving the U.S. and going to Europe because they're like, look at the finances of of the U.S. now, deficit blown out. Um, everything's really high priced and you, ha- and, and Euro is kind of neutral. It's kind of like, because there's so many different weird political incentives, it's actually like, can be the reserve currency for China. You know, it's that thing. We, I think we talked about it previously last week where they can invest there in each, you know, they're kind of printing over all the debt problems in a way. So. I don't know. I got to do some more research on it, but I just know that's not a great combo for the U.S. Hmm. Yeah, that is really interesting. I, um, you know, there was a narrative for a long period of time that right now the U.S. is doing a lot of printing. So is everyone else, right? And for a currency to, de- to debase, it has to debase relative uh, to something else. And if you have every central bank in the world that's printing at the same time, then there's this weird effect where they shouldn't really debase relative to other fiat currencies. Hard assets obviously should do super well in that environment. But even among all the different programs that the US rolled out, that alphabet soup or whatever, uh, there was still this perception that the US is the cleanest dirty shirt in the hamper, Mm -hmm. right? And that's why you actually did see during March of 2020, uh, the dollar rise and a bunch of money seemed to come into the US. Uh, So you're now saying that trend is actually reversing because that would be a pretty significant thing. Yeah, I think, uh you know, global capital, it, that's the thing about globalization is now it's like, you're not even taking into account just your, your own citizens incentives. 
you're taking into account Chinese incentives and Japanese incentives, who has the biggest pension fund on the planet. And when things change internally there, they change the asset prices here. So like, I think that's that global capital is fleeing, seeing, we're seeing it. So, you know, in your kind of mantra about this, this fight between, or not fight, but a constant push pull between labor and capital, capital has been trouncing labor, labor's due for a comeback. The problem is in that globalization paradigm, uh, capital is free to move between country, but labor is not. So how do you ever see labor really competing uh, or gaining a foothold back if even like we're just talking about right now, huge pools of capital in, in Asia can determine what's going on in the US? I think the politics will vote for it. You'll see unions come yeah. back. Profitability will fall. Profit margins, what companies will fall. More, you know, I think Biden wants to make better family situations where you, you know, maybe companies have to pay for childcare. I, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know, I know there's enough angst here in the U.S. And stuff like the Jimmy Goldsmith interview is getting surfaced on a mass Oh my God. You know, Mark, I got to stop talking. I've referred to that in like the three of the last four interviews I've done. It's so yeah. good. It's such a good interview. And people are aware of it. Yeah. You know, they really are. I think yeah. the average person is gets that they've kind of been, I guess, taken advantage of or, or not even like knowingly. It's just they haven't keeping up with the inflation of financial assets is really what it is. They get that. Yeah. And they probably want a piece of the pie. I think one of the biggest trends to look at over the course of the next 20 years is, I think you're absolutely right, um, that there's going to be a reverse in this 40 year, 50 year trend of globalization. And that you might actually see that significantly reverse itself. I don't know if that's actually feasible over a long period of time, but certainly I think politicians are going to try to stop it in the US and honestly kind of rightly so. I mean, I at least see the argument. I see where they're coming from. You know, the US playbook, I've talked about this ad nauseum I feel like the last month, but the US playbook used to be strong middle class driven by manufacturing. That is, the, that. I mean, a lot of other things, but that really is at the heart of what made us the greatest country you know, certainly from an economic standpoint, and honestly, from a quality of life standpoint, too, for a long period of time, we the globalization thing, we, we opened up, essentially, we made our middle class compete with a much lower, uh, you know, lower cost labor force mm. that they couldn't compete with. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know, it might just be as simple as that. I, I think deglobalization um, and decentralization, like you could have a more uh, nationalistic type balkanization of countries. Yeah. And also have a decentralization of currencies at the same time. Isn't that kind of fascinating to think? Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's like it's almost too bad that decentralization got taken up as this like mantra in the twenty seventeen ICO mania. And now when people just talk about decentralization, it's like, okay, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, buzzer, I get it, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, you made some money in crypto in 2017, but it really is like that is, I think, going to be one of the most powerful trends of my lifetime, yeah. at least. Uh, I actually write, wrote about it today in, in the newsletter, and I watched like this on some zero. They're like a financial platform, but mm -hmm. this guy, Divya Narendra, who started, you know, the first Facebook with the Winklevoss twins. He did an interview with the Winklevoss twins on it. And I talk about it, but they're like the biggest, most powerful dynamic for the next like 30 years is a world of centralization will die in decentralized platforms that give power to the masses. The atoms will, will inevitably grow. You just can't, if, if things grew more for centralization, you would be living in like North Korea. That's a monarchy. You can't have Jeff Bezos and, and Elon and Zuckerberg own everything. And that's really kind of what we would be heading towards if that growth still stayed, you know? Yeah. You know what else is like one thing that, have you heard that uh, quote that every business model is just unbundling and rebundling? You no, that? But expound um, on that. So like someone else said this thing, I don't know, I've always like quotes rattling around in my head. But uh, that basically scientific progress moves linearly, but economic trends tend to move in cycles mm -hmm. and ups and downs. And you can almost see it. There's like this random quality to it that, you know, it's like right now the big trend is away from advertisements and towards subscription. Mm -hmm. 
right? And what you're starting to see from a media perspective is, okay, that like did make sense, but now suddenly, let's just look at it from a streaming platform standpoint. You've got Netflix, you've got Disney Plus, you've got Hulu, you've got HBO Max, you've got Peacock, probably forgetting like 10 other, I got Apple TV, yeah. right? And at a certain point, it's like, God, well, damn, man, now I got to keep track of like 10 different subscriptions. Yeah. I almost wish there was a convenient way that I could just pay for one. And you can start to see, it's just crazy. Hey, why don't That's I why just go like back to real... Comcast and then just get the one? Yeah, why don't I just go back to Comcast? <laughs> yeah. And I think this is just like, you know, folding all this together, big macro thing. Like, cent- there are merits to centralization. You can clearly see merits. The problem is it has gone too far. You've talked about this. These mega corporations, honestly, Facebook, Vanguard, it's the same it's the same thing. They took a really good idea, they brought it to such scale that it's no longer serving anyone except for the managers at the top of those big companies. And guess what? There's like a natural reaction in the opposite way. And when people point out the problems with decentralization, they're absolutely right. The problem is we're in a world of such centralization that is due the pendulum is just due to swing mm-hmm. for a little while. I kind of feel like that's that's the way that I think about it at least. Uh, you know what's amazing too about growing things like that? at such scale is keeping and even growing a small company is hard where you get all sorts of weird politics. I can't imagine growing a company that is this a, is, are you talking about blocker right now, Tyler, by the way? Yeah, no, I just mean like you we're at, you're adding another 20 people maybe over the next year and it's like, it's so hard. I can't imagine where you have to be responsible for like, other people's families on like a 40 person company, let alone like how that must feel for like Jeff Bezos or at some point you're probably like, I didn't want this. Like I really did not want this. Like I don't want half the country warring or half the world warring on my social media platform. Right. I I, I actually think it's the, Hey, you know, that Stalin quote, one death is a tragedy, a thousand or a million is a statistic. I think like the first time we hired someone, that just yeah i don't know i just i listen to too many podcasts yeah. but i uh you know the first employer we ever hired was a good friend of mine uh riley and i remember thinking this is like a crazy level of responsibility like i it, like i have to make payroll and especially my job at blockworks has always been making sure the finances stay on track and you know that's been a great job at times it's been stressful because like i'm always worried like it, everything else goes to shit. we have to make payroll yeah. right um, and I think, you know, once you get to a big enough scale, you don't really think like that anymore. Cause there are so many people yeah. you just abstract it away. And I, I and saw that it just feels as personal anymore. Very, you know, when I traded at that trillion dollar asset management company, you don't think about your decisions as like, there's people you start, it's like when you go to the casino and there's chips, right? You start playing like games with like fake monopoly money at that level because if you actually think about them as people, it's too powerful. And I think like you have to disassociate yourself at that point, which I, I don't know. I, I have a hard time doing personally. I couldn't. I couldn't ever manage a giant company because I'm like, you know, to it. But dude, you're a, you a trader too. Traders, I'm always blown away by traders moving these vast sums of money. When, when you really think about it, think about the amount of money that you're moving in a transaction. Yeah. Like you, have you to almost have money. to abstract that away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, you, yeah, you're yeah. dealing with some guy's retirement and the, the, the way you do it is like, okay, this is like 10 basis points of a hundred billion dollar fund or something and even though it's hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars, you know, you're, you gotta like act like it's not. Like, that's sort of what happens at that level. I just, I think at some point you categorize humans where it's like, oh, he's a senior vice president and he's an executive director. And like it, you be, it becomes this like hierarchy of weird psychology instead of like, kind of like a, a real company with a personality and a culture. I think when you scale forever, it just turns into like, you're basically pay- playing like puppet master. Yeah. So don't ever do that, Mike. Well, <laughs> I, I, I'll try. Uh, yeah. I'll say getting yeah. back, getting back for a second to some of these trends, like you, you pointed this out to me. I thought this was super interesting. 
So the correlate the sixty day correlation between S and P five hundred and Treasury futures has actually turned positive. So there's this great quote on a day when risk aversion swept across everything from stocks and commodities to cryptocurrencies. Treasuries barely budged. In fact, the S and P five hundred and ten year Treasury futures haven't been positively correlated since uh, this positively correlated since nineteen ninety nine. So twenty two years. Uh, with the 60-day uh, metric reaching 0.5 on Wednesday. In contrast, the average correlation over the past two decades was negative 0.3, meaning a decline in stocks was often accompanied by a rally in bonds. This is a super, super important relationship, especially in institutional finance. Explain why. Why is this such an important thing to pay attention to? Well, treasuries have always been a hedge for stocks when stocks fall. It's like, mm. you know, the easiest thing to take your money from here and put it here for safety. And if that safety is not there and they're acting the same exact way, where the hell do you put your money? And mm -hmm. and that's risk parity has basically what it does is takes a, a portion of stocks and it takes a portion of bonds and it levers up the bonds so that they kind of counteract each other in that situation. If if they're correlated, that makes risk parity basically for past 4 years it's worked it makes risk parity dead, right? And I I got to think at some point all strategies die. And everybody, every baby boomer's kind of had this in a 60/40 portfolio. And if they're correlated for long enough, shit hits the fan. And so this is one of those things that everyone should have in the back of their their minds where if you can't get in if you can't, if stocks are falling and bonds aren't working, you're probably going to go to gold as a baby boomer with Bitcoin vol being this high. And we're seeing that, you know, gold's almost back at, let's see, 1900 ish. Yeah. 1876. It closed that today. And I think people are like, that's sort of what's happening with this. When these things correlate is they're looking for stores of value. They can't find them. So. Let's keep. Let's see if uh, this keeps going. What are the implications there? Because institution or uh, risk parity, you know, pioneered by uh, Ray Dalio over at Bridgewater, this has been a super, super popular strategy for institutional finance. I have no idea the amount of money that's um, locked up essentially in that trade. But do you think a the people who are managing those um, those funds have they seen this coming? Uh, B if not, like what does an unwind of that trade look like? I don't know. That's what's that's it's scary. I think it's a trillions. Yeah. It's in the trillions, obviously. I think Bridgewater loans like a hundred billion in their all weather fund or whatever. Um, but yeah, I I think it's almost like you can't let it unwind. That's how big it is, because every everybody who's retiring is, has a piece of this trade. And there's actually even an ETF called RPAR risk parity ETF mm -hmm. that I'm watching pretty closely. I'll talk about it more in the newsletters going forward, but I think that's going to be one of those to, to keep on the radar. It's just funny here. Like you can't let risk parity unwind. I don't know, man. I like, I totally get it. Right. I understand the, the consequences for bearing risk in the financial system are different than the consequences for bearing risk outside. Right. So like, let's say, yeah, everything really at the highest level is a game of capital allocation. So like if I, as one of the co-founders of Blockworks, make some stupid bets, right? I allocate my capital incorrectly or I overstretch myself or if I apply too much operational or financial leverage to the company, I can go bust. Nobody really cares, right? Even at like a higher level, like if Apple were to go bust, right? I don't know at this point because there might be knock-on effects, but like, okay, we don't have iPhones at the end of the day. That sucks. Yeah. But whatever. You know, it's different when it comes to finance because these are private companies and mm. these private companies are necessary to the functioning of all these other companies. And by the way, the entire wealth of the whole freaking nation is practically mandated that it be held in these things. So yeah. you kind of can't let them fail. Well, they, they could have in understand. 2008 and everything could yeah. have just reset. Maybe it was if you had a real free market. And I think we're just seeing yeah. this played out where I think the end game is the Luke Roman. We're just going to have really, really negative rates forever. And on the surface, those bonds will be, you know, 
at par and and mature to you know go all the way to maturity, but you're going to be losing money negatively on the inflation. So they'll back the bond market somewhere in the next couple of years. I think it's sooner, probably the next year. They're going to have to cap yield somewhere because if you if you let these things trade regularly, it'll be you know if you just get out if they just don't have any you know QE going on. Bond yields arise, the credit markets will constrict, and, and it'll be a cascade of asset prices. And that's where, you know, Kathy Wood does, is right when she says, like, this is a massively deflationary backdrop in some ways. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, look, the loot. Here's another thing that I don't know where I quite fall, right? And you hear people say things very differently. You know, when it, when it comes to inflation, like even what you just said, or like Luke Grumman says this too, you know, you just let inflation run hot for a little bit. Um, you know, you pay off the, all the debts, then, uh, you know, you, you can essentially pay off the nominal value of the debt, but your really GDP grows, quote unquote, because of inflation to a point where debt to GDP is manageable again. And, and there's this kind of reset and actually it ends up being good for economic inequality uh, because, you know, most of the most of the folks who are lending the the creditors are actually the wealthy, mm-hmm. right? It's kind of that this is like a soft default kind of inflation. Yeah. So, but then on the other hand, it's like I don't know, man. Inflation is kind of that. That's a sign of something being deeply economically wrong. Usually, when you you look through history, periods of inflation are accompanied by massive amounts of social unrest or like war or like other deep dysfunction. And I'm not quite sure it just works. I don't think it just works that nicely, basically. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll see. All I know is there's some generational imbalances and I'm kind of leaning into the camp of like, if you stifle a ge- for a generation, like labor supply for a generation, and then pound them with inflation, people are gonna get pissed. And they're coming for, you know, this is happening throughout the world too large amounts of debt on ba- government balance sheets. Like all it really takes, we're at the same levels of debt as World War II. Mm-hmm. So like, it's it's kind of like a tinderbox. It's kind of scary. I agree. I think there are some generational imbalances here. It's almost like there's room for a generational arbitrage. Yeah. Little Speaking Easter, of right? which. Uh, little <laughs> <laughs> stay tuned, stay yeah. tuned. Uh, all right, last story of the week. Um, so China bans Bitcoin again. All right, this was actually kind of the result of honestly headline crime from Reuters, who ran this headline, China bans financial payment institutions from cryptocurrency business. Here's what actually happened. Um, and process was reported by the block, I think, pretty well. Three SROs, which are self-regulated organizations, um, reiterated an existing stance that was already in place uh, as of 2017. There was a joint statement that was issued by the National Internet Finance Association of China, the Payment and Clearing Association of China, and the China Banking Association. The statement was issued under the context of continuing the execution of the PBOC's notices on preventing the risks of Bitcoin and initial coin offerings. Uh, And this was a policy that had been in place from 2017 on. You saw this uh, get issued amidst that crazy volatility that we were talking about before. So. There's a, there's no new information here. I guess you know you could interpret it as being bearish because hey, it's like hey this you know this thing that we said four years ago still around uh, and we're serious about it, uh, but like there's no new information there whatsoever. So did you see the speculation that this was like a organized thing to basically stomp out a big institutional investor? It was like some conspiracy theory. Is it's really forced like a margin call from someone who was over leveraged, I think, in China, and and then to create like liquidity to scoop Bitcoin at a, a cheaper price. But all these things are just so ridiculous, and the, the timing is is bad because you already have like a, a heavily retail oriented holder base, and it was just like the straw that broke the camel's back, you know. And I've seen this a million times in single stocks where the news is already known. Everyone's already in a weak holding position. 
And then some guy says some like a headline that gets reiterated that they said like a month ago and the stock goes down another 10%. And it's just, it really is a, a narrative game at that point. It's like, who's the strongest holders? Yeah. Which means it's a buying opportunity. I think I, you know, it's also, it's just so hard to say if you've been around in crypto for a long period of time, the amount of China FUD, I mean, seriously, like separately, 2013, China bans Bitcoin, 2014, China bans Bitcoin, 2015, China bans Bitcoin, 2017. It's like, dude, how many times can one country ban something? Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, seriously. And you know, it's, there's a funny thing with China too, where, yeah, it's technically banned. I think it's not ownership that's banned, but it's trading on um, exchanges and stuff like that. But I, I know for a fact, there's a huge ecosystem, there's a huge crypto ecosystem within China. I don't know how that works because you all you ever hear about is how banned it is and how illegal it is there. Mm -hmm. But I think that what that's had the effect of essentially fencing in, there's kind of, you know, different ecosystems within Asia. There's like, there's Japan, which has a big crypto community. There's China, there's South Korea. And I guess mainland China is kind of its own thing, but it's not like banned, dude. Like there's a huge market for that there mm -hmm. for sure. Um, Speak to me about the uh, trilemma. Yes, yes. Uh, absolutely. The, um, what is it? The impossible Trinity. Yeah. All right. So it's impossible to have all three of these things. One, a fixed foreign exchange rate Two, free capital movement, i.e. no capital controls three an independent monetary policy. This is like an old econ 101 type maxim, but I think it's important to understand here in the context of China because China has obviously chosen basically no country can have all three of those things. China has said, all right, the thing that we're going to do without free capital movement. Mm -hmm. Right, we're, we're, we have capital controls. Sorry, that's how we're going to maintain the other two policies, um, and you know that's how why you can kind of see this interaction. This makes complete sense, right? And understanding that the policy decisions that they've made from a monetary standpoint, they can't allow free movement of capital. So guess what? They're not going to be friendly to crypto. Mm. It's a, it's kind of like a funny position that they're in because they've decided we're you know this very technologically focused uh, country. We've made really long-term bets on technology, like healthcare technology, AI, all these very like frontier technologies. Mm -hmm. It might be that crypto ends up being the biggest of all of them and they literally can't get involved yeah. <laughs> or there's a huge hampering to them getting involved. Pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, and you know what I noticed too is obviously the Yuan is strengthening because the dollar's weakening. And if they have a strengthening Yuan, that means there's deflationary forces. I also noticed the People's Bank of China had a small dip in their balance sheet. So like deflationary pressures to try and cool off the, I think, kind of like labor inflation and food inflation there. I think that's sort of what's going on in China. And if, if they also get Bitcoin going bonkers, that means money is leaving, right? Like that means money is fleeing China. That's the old Mark Hart thesis from 2015. So if you have that, I can see – you. I would actually even make the argument that maybe this Bitcoin sell-off was really generated in China rather than Elon Musk, right? If they're trying to cool their economy and money is fleeing out, going to Bitcoin at an exponential rate, then they need to kind of pull out all the narrative triggers. That's great. I don't know. Dude, that's awesome. Yeah, I've never heard that. Uh, that's super interesting. I, You know, you kind of do have to give some credit to, like, I will say this, like Tether, def who knows, right? I mean, how backed it ever was. It appears like it's back now. Tether is definitely used to evade capital controls in China. Like, pretty openly, everyone kind of knows that. And you, look, you, it's okay to be like, okay, well, it was not really a just policy in the first place, so whatever. But when people are like, hey, this stuff is being used to evade capital controls, you can't really say no, they're not. It is. Yeah, that's what it's being used for. It might even be the primary use case of Tether. Yeah. I don't know. But I actually don't know where the flows I don't know. generate from, honestly, in, in Tether. I should probably get a Tether expert on here unless you, you – know, you're the yeah. stable coin guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we, you know, we need – actually, Nick Carter is the guy uh, for this stuff. Yeah. We need him. Um, we should do a three-way uh, round roundup one week. 
three right around now. <laughs> You're crazy. <laughs> <They're risky. laughs> it is Thursday. Thursdays uh, are the new Fridays, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. All right. I think that's uh what what's going on with you this weekend? Actually, why don't you because this is gonna air on Saturday, mm -hmm. I'm gonna out you here as an extremely thoughtful husband. So oh. go on and tell us. Well, well, what are we you got, my wife's birthday is tomorrow. And mm -hmm. When you have two kids under three years old, you have to go big on the birthday because if you don't, the downside is like, you know, minus 50%, like Bitcoin downside. It's worse than Because then you're like, more volatile than you don't crypto. care about me at all. You don't, you know, if you, if you screw up the birthday with two kids under three years old, it, it, then you're you, then you're an ass. Lord help you're you. An ass. God help you. So yeah, we're we're going. We got her mom. Her mom's flying in today from California. Oh, we got the sushi dinner set up for you know a good bunch of people, and then we got uh you know got to still go to, got to hit Party City for you know, streamers and all that other good stuff. So that's what I got going. Oh, we're probably right. just well, ruining the you. surprise. Very thoughtful. Oh, I <laughs> what do you got? What do you got going? What do I got going? I'm going. I'm going back home. Like I told you, my parents are uh, mo moving to Montana. This, this actually, I hope I don't out them too much here. Yeah. This is actually a really funny real world use case of, like Bitcoin. This made me think about my. So my grandpa, my grandma who recently passed away, mm. she. My grandpa had accumulated this collection of coins uh, over the course of his life. To the point where there's actually a lot of coins and it's a serious problem for them because they're like what do we do with all these coins? like collect like <laughs> collectors like, like old school collectible, yeah like collectible coins yeah. so like they live they they recently they're moving from massachusetts to montana literally what they're gonna have to do is drive these freaking things across <laughs> the country seriously so i like you know they're moving You're renting an armored truck. I, I gotta go get a bunch of stuff they're renting <laughs> renting a it's ridiculous. And I, and I, you know, you hear all these, these Bitcoiners sometimes talk about arguments of, you know, portability, fungibility, you know, you know <laughs> portability, all that stuff. And you're like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But now I'm like, oh my God, they're literally renting a <laughs> use case, use case. Yeah, they're literally. So anyway, so they're doing that now for Memorial Weekend. Uh, and I am going to go home this weekend. I got to get some stuff. I got to get my golf clubs and stuff like that. Nice. It's literally, it's an excuse for me to play golf with my dad, but you know what, whatever, that's as good of an excuse. There me. you go. So, from Massachusetts to Montana, that is something. Yeah. Do, yeah. Is Montana yeah. conservative? They gotta be, right? It is conservative, yeah. which is gonna be interesting yeah. for my parents. Uh, but they're not the place that they're going. They're going to uh, Big Sky, Big Sky, Montana, and Bozeman. Okay. So those are two, we'll, you know, we'll the, call it. the reason yeah. that, yeah, yeah, liberal pockets, yeah. but yeah, it's it's pretty conservative to say as a gotcha. place. Um, you know, that's, here that's last last theory. I think liberal cities in conservative states are the new best real estate to buy. You might be right, dude. You might yeah. be right. I mean, that's a good. You know, I actually love those. Uh, you know, I guess they call it purple states, but you know, I grew up in I grew up in Massachusetts. I don't know. I'll just overshare here, mm -hmm. but I was. Raised a Republican. Now I don't. I wouldn't consider myself necessarily affiliated with any political party. Mm -hmm. But you know, Massachusetts, super blue liberal oh, state, yeah. right? And uh, but you know, we've had uh, uh, Charlie Baker there for a long period of time. And I think it is very cool when you have a governor, or mayor, or something like that, who's uh, the different political party yeah. is the vast majority. Because it's just like, how much does everyone have to respect this person yeah. to override their like deep natural biases? You know. You know what? I, is that that really I, I worked for Mitt Romney when he was the governor of Massachusetts, and he was like very middle of the road, you know, Republican. He's a middle of the road guy. In in people loved him in Massachusetts. I thought um, people did. Yeah. yeah, no, I I think Massachusetts actually produces a lot of that because it's, it's a it's a blue it's a blue state, but I feel like we have had a bunch of uh, Republican governors. Yeah, I yeah, I mean, I don't know, not, but I wonder if anyone's ever done a study on that, like. The just if you looked at governors that were the opposite political party, the majority of their state, how effective were they? Yeah, it's kind of like there's that hedge fund thing, right? There are like two kinds of hedge fund managers. There are the ones that Malavine writes about this. They're like the ones that come from the wealthy family and their father and their father's father were in finance and like they're all. Why did you just do that voice? 
I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's part of an yeah, effect. Yeah, it's an effect. Yeah, yeah. I'm affecting something. Yeah. So there's that. The fall is fall. Yeah. You know, and then there's like the hedge fund manager that comes from nothing. Mm-hmm. And all else being equal, you should bet on the hedge fund manager who comes from nothing. Yeah. Because they've had to earn it and make their way in there as opposed to, not, not to say that you haven't earned it if you come from a wealthy background, yeah. but like more was given to you, right? You had more of an advantage. You to That's like uh, yeah. the Nassim Taleb where he's like, if you have a doctor who you know went to Harvard and has all the academic plaques and then you have this other guy that's been in the business for like, you know, 50 years and done 10,000 operations, you take like the 10,000 operation guy instead of the academic every time. 100%. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Not knocking Harvard or academics or anything. No, I am. Experience Trump's no. <laughs> <laughs> too much, Too much Massachusetts talk. Let's get out of here. Dude, just yeah. to end it where we all started, mm-hmm. everyone who has stuck around and listened to Tyler and me bullshit for these last five minutes, go look at this UFO video. I am telling you, it is <laughs> nuts, man. Go down a rabbit hole. Take some time. Hit the Wikipedia. Go see what the folks are saying. Apparently, there's a UFO Twitter. I had no idea. I don't know. Oh, what the, I like, know it's like Fin Twitter or crypto. Twitter? Yeah, it's like Fin Twit, but it's like UFO. <laughs> to buy some, <laughs> sorry, some personalities on that. Uh, I'm gonna get lost there. I mean, yeah. it is crazy. It is crazy. It's like you apparently. So these aren't ones that are released to the public, but apparently they have like super high def photos and videos of these things. Fifty feet things defy every law of physics, you know, they can accelerate, you know, I forget, really, really fast, no sonic boom, they can pass from air to water, they can stop <laughs> on a dime. Dude, it's just, you You hear this stuff. <laughs> to bring this full, full circle, who yeah. cares about ESG if that exists? That's what I'm saying. Okay, all right, I've got a I mean, like, this is gonna sound like, come on. So stupid. <laughs> how, how, how do markets react? How does humanity react? we find out they're aliens is it good is it good or bad man because i'll tell you okay here's the negative here's the negative i watch a lot of bad action Uh, movies they're they're sending sending their emissaries first and then they come with the big the big guns then the soldiers come (laughs) Uh, yeah there's no soldiers like literally imagine if humanity fought itself with today's technology 500 years in the in the past it wouldn't be a fight. It would be, I don't know what it would be, but it wouldn't be, good. it would be like probably one person wouldn't die from humanity today. Humanity now versus humanity 500 years ago, probably we wouldn't lose a single person, not one, maybe to like a weapons malfunction or something, but like literally not one. So last question, you have three yeah. movie characters in it, in the end of the world alien invasion to bring into your crew. Who would you choose? three movie characters oh god let's see honestly one probably jack bauer you know okay. old uh yeah yeah jack bauer i feel like um okay so he'd be like the muscle i guess i need one for just like entertainment maybe bill burr yeah maybe bill burr because you know what <laughs> he's not a movie character but that guy cracks me up and i feel like if it's an end of the world and aliens are coming we're all up Shit's Creek anyway, and at least I'd like to laugh about the whole situation, you know? He cracks up the funny. So I got Jack Bauer, he'd be the serious guy, you know, take care of supplies and weapons and, you know, fending off the cannibals and whatnot. Yeah. And then I got Bill Burr, who's making me laugh about the whole situation. And then, can I pick, can I pick fake movie characters? Can I do like Harry Potter? Whip me up some spells and just save the entire thing? Sure, why not? <laughs> Who would have said that? What would you say? I don't know. Yeah. I was okay. drawing a blank. Yeah, I, like, I felt very yeah, positive. Yeah. All, yeah. Right. All right. What about you? Oh. See, I'm like a bad action movie connoisseur, and I'd probably go with like uh, Bruce Willis from Die Hard, Jason Statham Great. in The Rock. Just bring the. Just they're going to kick some major ass. Come on. Right? I, I mean. Yes, man. But like. <laughs> In that situation, maybe so Jet Li, anyway. maybe Jet Li or Jackie Chan. I guess uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger yeah. in like the Predator, that'd be good. Wesley Snipes, like Predator, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Wesley Snipes. boom, <laughs> boom, yes, absolutely. Um, cool. Okay, but like hypothetically, is this a uniting thing? I could see if we find out they're aliens and 
everyone is in the nihilism, right? Religion is a lie. Nothing matters. There are these beings out there that could wipe us out in two seconds. Mm -hmm. What's the point of living? Yada, yada. Or it could be this really uniting thing. And it's like, why are we all fighting here, guys? We're all descended from the same, like, family of apes. At least we're all human. (laughs) At least we're all human, you know? Whatever. Maybe it's what happened at Independence Day. Throw Will Smith in there. Boom. (laughs) Boom. We forgot Will. Oh, God. Yeah, how do we forget Will Smith? He literally conquered him in the cinema universe. All right. Um, Well, that took a turn, but I'm glad we went there. These are the big questions. And you know what? I'm going to say this is the most important macro question uh, ever asked, because if there are aliens... (laughs) <laughs> kind of nothing speaking of tail like, risk, that's like, you know, number one right there. That's pretty big tail yeah. risk. That's Market wouldn't react, risk. though, if they All just right. came in. Yeah. Buy back. Just yeah, take buy, dude, the, dude, yeah, the interest rates will go so low. Yeah. <laughs> they go so low. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. You might be the richest person on the planet rates. with that, you know, truck full of coins. <laughs> yeah, literally yeah. Uh, negative five hundred. <laughs> All right, cool, man. All right. Well, <laughs> this is this was good. Until next week, See my you, friend. Dude.